Nothing in this video is intended to constitute advice or a recommendation, and you should not take any investment decision based on its content. The value of investments can go down as well as up, and investors may not get back the amount invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. Hello and welcome to this Tilney Investment Series uh, video uh, featuring uh, and focusing on uh, ESG and some of the issues around ESG data and how we overcome them from an investment perspective. My name is Louis French and I am the lead portfolio manager of our sustainable managed portfolios. Today I'm joined by Jamie Jenkins, who is the co-head of Global Equities and the lead fund manager of the BMO Responsible Global Equity Fund. And I'm also joined by Chris Bowie, partner and portfolio manager of the Sustainable Short-Term Bond Fund at 24 Asset Management. Thank you for joining us today. And to, discuss, to start the conversation, uh, we're really going to start focusing on the ESG data. So Chris, could you please outline how you use ESG data in your investment process and how you uh, overcome issues such as greenwashing? Thanks, Louis. Data is a key part of our process. We're really data-led because we have thousands of companies that could potentially be included in the portfolio. So we start by essentially doing a lot of screening, not just in terms of which sector they're in, but more than that, how they are changing their business to make them better, make them cleaner, make them greener. And therefore, we want to be along for that part of the journey. So we use data to help us form these opinions about which companies are doing the most on emissions, which are doing the most on the social side or the governance side. Where do we want to really back these companies? Where are they massively outperforming their peer group? Because we would expect to see the biggest fall in the cost of capital, potentially for those companies that are making the greatest transition. And therefore, we would like to invest in them to generate a capital gain on top of the yield that we might benefit from. The problem we have, and I'm sure we'll touch on this later, is all of the ESG databases that you can buy externally all work from a listed equity perspective. And we are credit investors, and really half of our credit world is from private companies or special purpose vehicles, so it can be very hard to get data for these companies. So a lot of the time we have to reach out to the company ourselves, we have to engage with them, gather the data, which is very time consuming. Then we have to think about it and then we have to collate it and analyze it versus peers. So really 55% of the time, in fact, we're doing this primary data gathering ourselves. And it's taken us years to get this data together, in fact. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Chris, particularly around the kind of the issues like you highlight with kind of fixed income availability of data. And Jamie, kind of how do you approach this from a global equity perspective? I know, you know, you've been focused on this area for a number of years now. Is there any of the kind of comments you recognize from, from Chris there? Yeah, I mean, I do. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I, I do certainly recognize some of Chris's comments there. Uh, of course, we're, we're lucky in the sense that we are solely investing in public equity. So, you know, the quality of data has immeasurably improved over the last, particularly the last five years, um, and, and even the last 10, um, you know, we, we have always acknowledged data integrity is an important part of our approach. And because of the slightly patchy quality of data going back 10 plus years, we've always had a dedicated in-house responsible investment team to help us as the specialist portfolio managers navigate our way through the data landscape. Now, of course, it's improving today. But increasingly, our activities are taking us into to, towards certain emerging market opportunities. There we see data quality degradation again. Um, and certainly in the small and medium sized cap market capitalization area, you also see a degradation in data quality. So it, it's important to, um, you know, you have to do your own homework. Uh, we have a, you know, assembled body of expertise to help us as the PMs run the strategies. But the good news is the trajectory is improving. The data is improving, but it is important to, you can't just take it at face value still. You've got to do your own homework on it too. Yeah, th thank you, Jeremy. I, I could see Chris nodding along there as well as I was. So I think we all recognize the kind of journey and the evolution of the ESG data set and what's available, uh, particularly from public listed companies, as you say. Um, given these kind of some of the biases and some of the structural issues in, in the market, how important do you believe that active kind of active management is? And, you know, can you outline how you engage with some companies, please? And I'll start with uh, Jamie, Jamie first in this question. Yeah, thanks for the question, Louis. Look, 
engagement and active ownership has always been important to us. It's a key third. It's a key third pillar of our investment philosophy of to avoid, to invest, and to improve. Um, and of course, it's got a lot of focus in recent years. The the, the idea that institutional investors should stand up and really deepen that dialogue with companies. We would observe that it does make a difference. You know, we are seeking to invest in companies for a very long term horizon. Um, and establishing a deeper dialogue with companies has always been our approach. And I think that that, that approach is very, re is very much resonating with the market today. Um, and I think it is leading to better quality of conversations with the companies we invest in. Um, so, you know, we think engagement is a very valid tool for improving the risk and return profile of the companies we invest in. And, you know, it, won't, it probably won't come as a huge surprise to many of your, your watchers today that, you know, those companies who have a more proactive approach to environmental, social and governance issues typically tend to perform better from a financial perspective and that volatility of, of of investment return as an investor is actually improved as well so we think it's it, it's a it's a very sort of a powerful um uh sort of relationship between the, the the investment manager and the companies to try and to try and have a really upfront conversation about these environmental social and governance issues and and, and ultimately that that is improving returns yeah, and thank you Joe. is there any examples that you can provide or you know to add a bit more color in any kind of portfolio companies that you have found the way kind of the active engagement has worked. Perhaps they didn't realize that they had to disclose certain information to investors. You mentioned emerging markets earlier. Is that is that an area where you're seeing better engagement coming forward out of you know, company boards? Yeah, it certainly is an area. I mean, I maybe call out a couple of areas. Um, I mean, since you mentioned emerging markets, we, we, we've had we, we've done some very had some very interesting conversations with HDFC Bank in India. It's one of our off benchmark emerging market positions. Um, you know, we're very optimistic about the long run potential of that bank providing access to financial services for a significant number of completely unbanked people in India through their advanced uh, digital rollout of services. Anybody with a mobile phone can now have access to their banking services. So we think there's a good story around that. But we've spoken to them particularly around their climate risk management uh, in line with the um, uh, climate related financial disclosure regulation. So they're getting on board with that. And, and so, you know, wherever companies are around the world, they are coming into the sort of coming under the umbrella of these large, uh, you know, the, the, these conversations about global regulation and, and emerging market companies, companies with a leading position are, are also included in that conversation. Another example I'll give you is Kerry Group. So Kerry Group, the uh, Irish listed um, uh, food and ingredients maker. You know, we've spoken to them a lot over the last five plus years um, about that, that they're already pretty good in terms of what they're doing. We, we, we think they have a very positive role to play in terms of improving nutrition in making food healthier, tastier, more natural. Um, but they've also, although they were quite good around sustainability, sustainability disclosure we've pressed them to be more explicit about water intensity um, uh, more and in, more explicit about their willingness to contribute to the global movement to, to to improve certification of palm oil access so that's another access and that's a, so another interesting point and and most recently we've been pushing actually for them to think about divesting of their consumer foods business in the uk which they actually announced recently we're very optimistic about that it makes the business purer. We think that can help the company re-rate. And very shortly after the selling of that consumer foods business, um, they've actually announced another um, uh, uh, food ingredients bolt-on deal, which we think is really continuing to pivot them towards the, those healthier nutrition trends. So, um, you know, they're kind of on that journey already, but have we hopefully helped to accelerate that? I, I think possibly we have. Very interesting, Jamie. Thank you. And Chris, can I come to you, please, on kind of how you approached kind of engagement, particularly with companies from a, you know, as a fixed income investor, um, just to get any kind of, you know, how you're approaching um, this area? 
Absolutely. You raised a key point. We don't have an equity team, so we don't get to vote on anything. The power that we have is through engagement. And we spend a lot of time recording engagements and reporting on this to clients on a monthly basis. And they love to read these war stories because it really brings the whole topic alive. I'd say we've had um, you know, successful engagements where we've managed to change company behavior. We've had failures where we've ended up having to sell, bo sell bonds. One interesting example we had in the fund last year was a student finance deal that we really liked but was sponsored by a private equity house. And we had real trouble getting CO2 data from them. They kept promising they were going to deliver it. Month after month went by, they never did. We ultimately had to sell the bond. And we have found this slight um, bifurcation between listed companies generally being very good at reporting, being very transparent. Some private equity led deals have been harder to get information out, but I would say they're starting to get the message and they are starting to improve their transparency and their reporting, and that helps everyone. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, like you said, the contrast between the information and the transparency. So transparency in this area is obviously very, very important for, for underlying investors. Uh, and linked to that is obviously a, a, you know, a dramatic increase in new ESG related regulations coming through here in the UK, obviously across Europe and, and the rest of the world. Chris, did you want to comment on kind of how you're looking at some of the new, these new regulations, in particular kind of SFDI in Europe and obviously here in the UK, the task force for uh, climate related disclosures, please. Yes, if I start with SFDR, we've made some changes. We had initially adopted what I would call a very conservative approach. We had said our sustainable funds are Article 8, our integration funds are Article 6. But what we found across Europe is essentially many providers are saying everything we do is at least Article 8, even if it doesn't really go particularly far into ESG or sustainability. So we've actually changed our investment process slightly to allow even our integration funds to be reclassified as Article 8. And we're currently asking the regulator for permission to reclassify them as Article 8. So essentially, we will have light green Article 8 and dark green Article 8, which will be the sustainable funds. Perhaps there's an argument to be made that our sustainable fund range could be called Article 9. That's perhaps something we'll do next year. But for this year, it's about getting those Article 6 funds to be Article 8. When it comes to TCFD, in principle, it's something that we really want to support. The issue we have comes back to us poor old credit investors with the lack of data. And although we are already reporting a lot in terms of CO2 impact, the question we have is what are the forward looking indicators going to be? What data will they demand? And is that data even available for credit investors given that half of our world is in private companies? So we need to see the detail before we can fully commit to it. In principle, we want to, but we can't sign up to something that is an open-ended question about reporting where we might not be able to get the data very easily. Thanks, Chris. And yeah, I, I recognize completely the, the comments, particularly around the, the principal adverse impact data of the SFDR regulations. And, you know, even us at Tilney, uh, you know, that will have SFDR compliant funds, sustainable fund. We're all managing and wrestling with these issues <laughs> around data so we can disclose it, you know, appropriately for the regulator before the next level of um, reporting. And Jamie, you know, from a BMO perspective, how are you guys kind of kind of approaching this? Well, I recognize some of Chris' comments about taking a relatively conservative approach. Um, that's certainly our, our typical way of operating. So um, our responsible global equity strategy, we classified as an SFDR8 uh, fund initially. Um, we're currently in the process of uh, looking to take that up to a, probably a nine. Uh, we already have a SFDR nine fund. It's called our, our SDG engagement global equity strategy which is really explicitly using uh, engagement objectives ex ante the investment decision. So basically across our, you know, our, our range of sustainable and responsible funds, we're gonna use eight as the kind of baseline and for even the more advanced funds we'll be going to a, to, to a kind of nine. And we're very close to that already, but I just think you know, initially we wanted just to be very authentic, be very thoughtful about not over promoting the integrity of the funds. I think um, you know, now we understand the landscape a bit better, we feel that we can really get to that nine level. Uh, so we're hoping that, that that's gonna be a nice sort of differentiator for some of the funds. Um, but uh, you know, we are convinced, or I am convinced that the, the seeds of the next mis-selling scandal have well and truly been sown already. So I think it's right that you know, pr practitioners should be cautious around this issue of greenwashing, not over-promoting what they do. And, and so that's very much the, 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 the approach that, that we're taking. On climate, you know, we're trying to be proactive. We're trying to participate in the agenda. 
we're a founder member of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Uh, we're trying to all you know, work together with our responsible investment team, Vicky Bakshi, our real climate specialist, to try and understand what, what kind of metrics we do need to be reporting on. But not just you know, the, the metrics, but also you know, what do we really need our companies to be doing? How do we affect real change as participants in the, in, in the climate debate? So this is going to be a really ongoing hot topic for us to engage um, around for the next couple of years. And, uh, you know, I think the penny is well and truly dropping that there are immense challenges to get anywhere close to the type of carbon emission reduction that we need to do by the end of the decade. So we're trying to dial up our conversation with the companies we invest in. Yeah, I completely agree, Jamie. And, you know, as, as we've discussed already, obviously, this is a evolution, I think, and, you know, trying to align those kind of positive impact, um, you know, principles of our investments and, and the transparency of the ESG is obviously important for the for the whole of the industry, uh, in particular in tackling you know greenwashing, as you say. So moving on to kind of the outlook, you know, so we, we we've highlighted some of the issues and some of the you know the ways that you know both of your funds kind of seek to over, overcome these. In terms of outlook, where do you kind of what do you see next for for the industry and and the opportunities you see you know available in the market? And if I start with Jamie on this question, please. Um, so I think you know if you think about sort of spe the, the, the rise of specialist ESG funds. I, th I think that has been well understood and well appreciated by many market participants now. And, and, and the way that these ESG funds can really optimize risk and return outcomes. I think that is increasingly well appreciated and the, the returns vouch for that. I believe going forward, we're going to see a much bigger shift towards impact the sort of impact investing that delivers real world improvements because of that broader recognition that we're not moving fast enough. And, and I think we need to think about, to a degree, ripping up the playbook, creating newer products that are more explicit about what they're trying to achieve. Perhaps they have dual or triple um, objectives, not just a return objective, but they're actually trying to achieve societal and environmental change as well. So that's something to think about. So I think you're going to see the evolution of impact frameworks becoming much more prevalent. Um, I think it helps if you have external validation of those frameworks. Uh, I think our whole industry has a job of job of work to do to really uh, affect more, you know, more meaningful change. Uh, one of the ways which we're going to be doing it is by embedding more science-based initiatives into the investment we're working on. I think we have to have the scientists talking to the asset managers, talking to the companies um, more going forward. So we're looking, you know, the, the sort of the, the science-based targets initiative, we're hugely supportive of that. We're looking for ways to really reinforce our research and, and, and our portfolio construction to better uh, embed some of these aspects. So I think there's more intentionality, more transparency uh, and, 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 you know, we've got to, I think asset owners and asset managers have got to keep thinking a bit differently. We've got to push the envelope here. That's what I think is going to be happening. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, as signatories of the principles of responsible investing at, at Tilney, we recognise these. And obviously, I know, but I know kind of both of your portfolios to an extent look to align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I think you're completely right around, you know, completely right around frameworks and the direction of travel and the importance of Know some of those issues and Chris can I come to you please and see kind of how you're looking at the market now particularly with that fixed income angle and as you know as, as a, a relatively new, you know newer fund um, in the kind of ESG space sustainable space. Absolutely so there's a massive weight of money argument partly because of regulation partly because of trends that's going to continue driving investment into sustainable credit and government bonds as well and I think we will continue to see a fall in the cost of capital. The interesting challenge will be what happens for those sectors, the sin sectors that are going to be negated here? Are they going to become private companies? The cost of capital is likely to rise, but ultimately those yields will be very attractive to a certain investor base. And the challenge we have with fixed income indices is those indices might struggle then to deal with these differing worlds. So I think we're going to see a continued growth of sustainable credit indices. We're going to see a continued growth of credits or ESG databases. And there is an interesting dynamic here. If we look at the correlation between ESG databases, it's very low compared to credit ratings. 
So I think also the industry needs to be a bit more transparent about the methodologies used, the value judgments applied, and give investors there more color, more transparency, that if they sign up to ratings from one fund rider, for example, they're implicitly accepting their view of the ESG world. And we you do find some funny outcomes. You know, when we originally did the work, we found companies that scored particularly well on some databases didn't really chime with what we felt would be good ESG companies. Soft drink companies, for example, or cruise operators often scored very well. So I think end investors need to understand that if you adopt somebody's methodology, you might end up with holdings that you didn't expect. Very interesting, Chris. Thank you. And thank you very much for, for joining us today for this for this webcast. Um, we'd like to thank you very much um, for, from everyone at Tilney. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for listening to this kind of investment uh, series video. Uh, I'm hoping we will uh, produce more with some of our funds that feature in our Tilney sustainable portfolio. And we'll end the, we'll end the recording there. Thank you. This video does not constitute advice nor recommendation relating to the acquisition or disposal of investments. No responsibility can be taken for any loss arising from action taken or refrained from on the basis of this video. Different funds carry varying levels of risk depending on the geographical region and industry sector in which they invest. You should make yourself aware of these specific risks prior to investing. Please note that some ethical funds may, by definition, have a limited investment universe. The value of investments can go down as well as up, and investors may not get back the amount invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. Issued by Tilney Investment Management Services Limited, authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority.